My name is Malik. I'm from Atlanta, and you are now watching 3LW TV. Welcome to 3LW TV. I'm Lonnell Williams on location in Atlanta, Georgia, where tonight I am participating in a panel discussion hosted by Terrence Dean, who is celebrating the release of his new novel called Mobile. Most notoriously, people may remember me from my book, um, Hiding in Hip Hop on the Down Low in the Entertainment Industry from Music to Hollywood, which was the memoir of my life of working in the entertainment industry. And after I finished that book, a lot of people assume there would be a follow-up to Hiding Hip Hop. And I considered it, um, but then I still have to work in this business. So, <laughs> unlike Corinne, I said, well, I'm gonna fictionalize my characters and do a follow-up to it called Mogo, based on actual people in the business who you all may or may not recognize. So, doing Mogo, I, um, I thought about the characters, I thought about the people, I thought about my many years of working in the entertainment industry, 15 years, and most notably I was last with MTV where I produced um, movie awards, video music awards, hip hop honors, rock honors, all the live awards shows at, at MTV. And just a lot of the personal friendships I had and I have with um, a lot of celebrities and their intimate partners. So. Um, my agent came to me and said, well, you know, what's, what's next for you? And so I said, well, I want to do a fiction novel. And thus, here we are with mobile. So 10 years ago, I, um, in New York City, I did this panel called Young Black Gifted and Gay, Powerful Men in the Entertainment Industry. And this was at a time when the New York Times and the Village Voice had done this explosive article. I don't know if you all had read or seen the article in the New York Times or the Village Voice about the down low. And they had went to this club in the Bronx called The Warehouse. How many of y'all from New York? Y'all know about The Warehouse, right? <laughs> in the Bronx. So they had pictures of guys running out of the club, you know. And it was this explosive interview that they did. And, and it just caused this big stir. And at that time, I was still struggling with my sexuality. And I was in the entertainment industry, but I hadn't really met any openly gay men. Um, there were only a few. So I decided to put together a panel discussion because I said, well, there are a lot of us who are in the entertainment industry who are part of hip hop, we create hip hop, we help shape it, and we are the, we are, sometimes a lot of us are the voices of hip hop. And it was a powerful discussion because I really wanted to show that we were a part of this industry and that our voices were going to be heard. And literally, as I was talking to my publisher, I said, wow, wouldn't it be great to re visit this conversation 10 years later. Because at that time, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter. Um, celebrities were not coming out. There were not pictures of celebrities, new pictures, sex tapes. Um, there were not a lot of images of us on television, so there wasn't Noah's Ark, there wasn't Dirty Laundry, there was no Real Housewives of Atlanta with Lawrence and Dwight. Um, and there was no Mr. C. Well, there was. <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. Um, so <laughs> I said, well, let me revisit this panel discussion. And I did it in New York when the book first came out, uh, when Mogul first dropped. And we did it in New York. So I went to do it at the home of where all of us were. And it was a phenomenal panel turnout. A lot of people came. And I said, I want to do it in Atlanta because it's the new Black Gay Mecca and it's also the new entertainment capital. And there are a lot of um, entertainment personalities here who I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with and they have joined me today. Ten years later, you know, do you think that we've changed and we've come any further than we were ten years ago? I think the work that that, uh, that Patrick E. Polk has done, that Quincy DeAndre have done, and myself, um, 
uh, Deborah Wilson, there's so many amazing filmmakers. Uh, I think it does make a difference. I think the fact that we see the amount of people who are doing projects on the internet and the amount of people who are creating independent films is simply because of the fact that the door has been opened and now there's an opportunity and a market has been created. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do. I know Patrick right now is actually shooting a film called The Skinny in New York, and it's been very, very difficult for him to raise money for that film. I know other filmmakers have had that same situation. Um, so it's tough. Not everybody has a sort of a dirty laundry moment where a film does well and people like it, and so how do you continue to get it out there? And I think for us as a community, we have to be... Um, it's not so much that we even have to be supportive of what filmmakers are doing. We have to be vigilant about what artists are doing in our community. You really do. It's not just enough to buy a book. It's not just enough to go see the movie. You have to tell other people about it. Because if we don't do it, no one else does. Because we don't uh, have the benefit of the same type of PR machine that a lot of mainstream artists do. So this is the PR machine. I want to go and take that where you're talking about our images on television and going to George because you, with your own financing and your own money, created this reality show um, and it went viral and all over the internet and people were talking about it, you know, media takeout, boss up and all these other people. There was some negative press about it, there were some positive things about it. Why did you decide to do that, you know, and what what has and where are you are today with the project? Uh, today we're in pre production. We have uh, got a deal with the network through a production company. Um, because we're in pre production and we're getting all of the legalities out the way. I choose not to just say what network, but we are in pre-production. I think in the beginning, in doing it, I just wanted to tell my story of how I saw things uh, from my perspective as a black gay man. Um, when I looked at the TV, I just didn't see the life that I live and represent. So I said to myself, you know, tell your story. Um, one of the things that was important to me was not to walk up to a production company's door and have this great idea and ask them to interpret it uh, for me, so I created my own company and I financed it. But one of the things I got quickly educated on is that when you bring people in to help you tell your story, you have to keep the integrity because when it went viral, there were a lot of things that happened. The first thing is that we didn't leak the trailer, someone leaked it, and uh, we had shown it here locally in Atlanta, so that wasn't a big deal when they told me on Valentine's Day it was uploaded to YouTube, so I said, No problem, I went to bed. I woke up February 15th and literally my life had changed overnight because I got a call and said, you're on MediaTakeOut.com. And honestly, I didn't know what MediaTakeOut.com was because I just didn't read the blogs or anything. And so I remember logging on and looking at it and we have about, what, 5,000, 6,000 views. And I remember sending a text out and I remember calling the team that I was working with. And in 30 minutes, it went to 17,000 and then it just started climbing. And so then I started calling people because this was new for me. I have a background in music and entertainment, but not the media side. So some people say, well, hit a dial. And then after that, every day, a new blog, a new statement, and then, you know, the spin, that we would download guys doing this show, and everything just got crazy. Um, the perspective of telling the story. And so for me, it was just a situation I learned that, you know, you have to tell the story, and you have to allow yourself to speak your voice, and you have to be vigilant with your projects. When you actually see the show that's going to be developed for TV, what you're going to see is um, interesting black men who happen to be gay. Talking about that, representations of positive role models and positive men, LGBT members of our community, Lanell, you created this whole empire. <laughs> Everyone knows you, especially for your bedtime secrets, your bedtime stories. Um, <laughs> why did you decide to do that? And do you think 10 years later, that progressively you move forward, we're moving forward. I go back maybe 10 years at the dawn of the internet and into where we are today. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, we still have uh, you know, a long way to go. But we've also come a long way, and I think it's important that we recognize that. I didn't set out on this 3OWTV Pillow Talk adventure um, intentionally. I travel a lot through my business. I've been to 39 countries so far and counting. And as a part of that, I, just, I was originally just um, posting travel pictures and sharing them with people. And then people started sharing them with other people. And I was like, the emails were getting out of control. So I said, I'll put them on a blog. When I come back from a trip, you'll get an email. And then from that, um, it kept growing. And <clears throat> I was actually visiting a panel, uh, uh, panel discussion here in Atlanta. And I didn't put much familiarly into the whole blogger world. But 
um, at the end of this panel discussion, I got up and I, st I made a statement. And then when I got to work the next day, one of my coworkers said, oh, I read about your, your statement on the blog yesterday. I was like, what are you talking about? And it actually happened to be Darian, LOL Darian's blog, who had quoted me anonymously, but my coworker recognized the quote. And so then I started looking at his blog, and I was like, wow, there's some really powerful stuff going on out here. And then from there, I had an opportunity to meet B. Scott. We went out to California, we had dinner. At the end of the dinner, we did a, just an impromptu interview on camera. And when I posted it, it did really well. And I thought, you know what, maybe I could actually do something more with this. But if I'm going to be on and doing this whole YouTube and starting my own thing, then what I need to do is make sure that it has a purpose. And what is missing? Because I saw a lot of different people doing things, but nobody was connecting. It seemed like everybody was trying to, they have their hustle over here, they have their hustle over there. And I was like, well, I'm pretty good at being fair and trying to bridge people and let them be their authentic selves and bring them together. And really, uh, once I started doing that, uh, after, I, after I did B. Scott, then it became easier to get more and more people, and then suddenly it was just crazy. So it's just been an amazing ride uh, with what's going on, and just watching the love and receiving the love, and watching, also seeing how some of the other YouTubers and some of the other bloggers are changing their approach and really reaching out to connect with other people. Not, not trying to take credit for any of that, but I'm seeing a lot more of it, and that I be believe that we really are beginning to understand our power and trying to use it more, more productively. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You were not out prior to when you started your blog, because I, I followed you from SOHH.com. For those of y'all who don't know, you know, he started SOHH.com. Um, then you branched out and said, I'm going to do my own thing. And then you just created this whole this empire with Giant Unplugged. You had Giant Unplugged Television and Radio. And then you started with BET. And then you, you know, Comcast on demand. But how did you? Why did you come out? Because you weren't out, and then when you did finally come out, why did you feel the need to come out? And and, and approaching the ball the way you do, as um, Lanell said, you know, he comes from it from a different perspective. Why did you choose your perspective and the way that you approach it, which is very Wendy Williams almost like? And one of the things that kind of always drew me into Wendy Williams originally is how I got into, into this game was I am a huge believer in in truth telling, and I think that. You know, if I look around and I see so many different people who are lost in this world, and it really is because no one's living in truth. And so anything that I did with my blog or anything that I continue to do is I always try to keep that first and foremost, but first and foremost, but always try to make it funny so it didn't seem like I was just like, you know, being quote unquote messy or whatever have you. Um, and then literally three months ago, I remember I was watching Oprah, and she just did her last season, and she was, uh, you know, tying loose ends with, with previous shows, and uh, Greg Luganis came on the show, I think, I think it was like National, either, either, it was either National AIDS Day or, or, or National Coming Out Day, I forget which one it was. Um, and not, 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 not to quote it too, of course, but uh, the thing that I found interesting was she had a guest on the show expressing to her how important it was for Breaking the Surface and how that book really, really inspired them to come out. And it was literally, like I was literally watching myself. I remember that was the whole thing for me. I was maybe about 14, 15 years old, and I had just learned about, you know, the UK, the UK novels, and my first book was uh, Breaking the Surface, and I read that book like four times. It was just so compelling, and it's such a reflection as to what I was dealing with at that, at that point in time. So it was literally just a moment of divine intervention, uh, kind of mixed in with, with, with reality. I just, you know, for me, it's important as being a, a, a man of color to let young, younger people of color to know that they are, will be okay. And that, you know, you just kind of go after your passion and your love and don't let your sexuality come into play. I go after anybody who I feel tries to make gay a negative. You know, I feel like if you try to make gay a negative, then I have every right to pounce on every insecurity I can visibly see on, see on you. It's just interesting because, you know, uh, when John is talking about living in truth, it's so oftentimes, not only are we not living in truth, but we have a certain amount of shame that we swallow all the time. And I think many times for men of color, we think of gay being a negative, or gay is something that I have to overcome. That's not necessarily true. You don't have to necessarily overcome the fact that you were poor, or that you were black, or that you were gay. You can use all of those things. For me, I love being gay. I absolutely adore it, and I trumpet it all the time. And for, I also recognize that in my career, if I was straight, I would be standing in line to direct, you know, Fast and Furious 8. 
you know what I'm saying? And some unknown rap people. But the reality is, I was the young, articulate, because you know the, the white folks like that. I was the young, you know, I was the young, uh, good, well-spoken director that was gay that had directed a gay film. And so that was a thing, and that was a story. The same thing happened within the, you know, within uh, within the life of Atlanta. Was just like, oh wow, these are gay guys doing this, doing that. The same things happened with Lonel. The same things happened with Giant. With all of us, on some level, being gay can be something to talk about. And you have the ability to determine whether that conversation is positive or negative. Simply make it a positive, keep it pushing, and tell the kids to kick rocks. <laughs> As an ally for the gay community, and someone who reports stories, and sees things, and certain things, do you think 10 years now, or even within the next year, or coming up soon, and mainstream artists will ever come out? And if they do, do you think that it will be acceptable? I understand that homosexuality is accepted in, in most circles, but as far as you know, the the, the worldwide you know eye on Diddy, Jay Z, whoever, it, I just don't think that that it would ever happen, and I don't know why. I, I, honestly, I feel like I should be sitting there like watching the past <laughs> because I'm kind of like just in awe of everybody and everybody's story as far as you know you coming out of it, you know your in the entertainment industry and like me being on the outside looking in I see so much going on every day and it's like dang is everybody gay like what, what's going on but you know but it's just the fact that you know just like okay I'm gonna give you an, an example when I first met Giant it was I mean it wasn't even a secret like when we were talking, I knew he was gay. He told me that he didn't tell me he was gay, but it wasn't a secret. But it's like it's almost like that in the entertainment industry. I know several entertainers who are gay, but they're not gonna tell you, you know, that they are. So they just let you make their own your own judgment or your own assumptions. So I, you know, I, I guess that's just playing it safe. As far as you know, I'll be acceptable with with you, and I'll be acceptable with you. And if I see you on the street, you know. So I mean, so no, I don't, I don't know. But I guess that's the. Can we have a voice in radio? I know there, here in Atlanta, there was some, what was the person in Miss Sophia. Miss Sophia, who's no longer on the radio, right? No, she's not. Right. Um, but it was groundbreaking, right, for Atlanta to have someone like that, a voice on the radio. We don't have that in New York, you know, and you would think New York being a progressive city that we would have someone out there like that. Um, but do you feel comfortable and are you safe? And then also, where do you see more voices of, of us on the air, and is there room for us to be at the table and radio? Greetings and salutations, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm your contestant number one, <laughs> two, three, four, five. Uh -huh. I know, right. Um, <laughs> it's always this. Um, I actually started doing YouTube videos um, because I had got fired from my corporate job at Home Depot um, as I was laying in bed on Labor Day. Um, <laughs> that's not funny. <laughs> they actually called me and said, hey, your services are no longer needed. Uh, on Labor Day, 2008, I'll never forget it. And I wanted to vent um, because I was hot, upset, and angry because, for one, you called me <laughs> on my day off, right? <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> On my day off, and a friend of mine, um, who happens to who happens to stay at the house that weekend, had a camera and was like, "Hey, you should make a video." And I was like, "Okay, right, yeah, right, whatever." So a couple of days passed, and I was sitting at home like, "Oh my God, what am I going to do?" Because now I have to go look for a job. Because I've never, thank God, and I've been blessed that I've always been recommended for a job and never had to go out and stomp the pavement and all that kind of stuff. So this was like shocking to me that now I have to actually do a resume and go out. So. It was like, okay, let me, you know, do this vent and this, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But I wanted to do it in a silly way. So we did two videos. One video where I, I showed myself on a downward spiral. Um, I had turned to alcoholic drugs and chicken <laughs> and, and trained. <laughs> um, so trained and I was coming out. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and then the next video was, okay, well now rent is due, so what do I do? So I, me and Mike, another friend, 
went out on Cyprus Street. <laughs> <laughs> and for those living here in Atlanta, you know what Cyprus, you know, you know what Cyprus is. Don't they all? Uh, well, don't go there. <laughs> They're doing great. It's, it's the, it was the straw, it's the straw, you know what? You know, yeah, okay. So I, we had took like a video camera, I had went out and you know, was acting like I was <laughs> cooking and picking up dates and stuff. And, and stuff like <laughs> like that, and the and the video, and I honestly had not expected anyone to see the video, but like my five friends, and then all of a sudden, um, very popular bloggers like Michelle straight from the A.com, um, Fresh from Crunk, Tactical, and oh uh, yeah, and they had picked it up, and then it was like, girl, what you doing on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> so from there, I knew I had a voice, and. Then I started doing other videos about stuff that I wanted to talk about. But from from the power of YouTube was something I was not expecting. Um, and thank God I had friends that actually allowed me or gave me subject matters to talk about. Um, my popularity grew. I still did not know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. It was just, okay, we'll continue to put out a video because people are asking for them. But then what are you saying? Um, I was one of those people that never read the comments because I know how my mouth is and how delicious it can be. So, I was never one to read comments on my videos, so I always ask my friends for their feedback um, as far as picking topics to do other videos. Uh, with the popularity of the videos and stuff, my internet presence grew. Um, from there, so Daniel had a great idea, uh, something that he's always wanted to do was do radio. He worked at V103, so he knew a lot about radio and things of that nature, so he came up with the idea of Better Days Radio, so the two of us together um, I don't want to say it became the voice of a community, but I knew we had a voice. Right. And then from there, it was, <clears throat> okay, well, we're black gay men, so of course they automatically expect us to talk about entertainment news, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with talking about that. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like I need to ed needed to educate my people, because there was a lot of stuff that I did not know. But talk about working behind the scenes because we you know we these most majority of people here are all in front of the camera or their presence is known and we know them by their blog names, um, their visual presence, um, and directorial presence. But you are behind the scenes. Are there more of us behind the scenes? Are there can there be more of us behind the scenes? And what has what was your experience working behind the scenes in radio, which is a male dominated figure field? Um. Absolutely, there are. There's a plethora of us behind the scenes. That and you know, if it wasn't for us, you know, a lot of the fabulousness that you hear on the radio, um, from the way people, the hair and makeup on television, there are all sorts of people. We are literally the grease that makes the that, grind, that makes the wheels turn within this industry. Um, as far as my experience over at B one hundred three and W A O K. Um, I must say that I wouldn't have even gotten in the door over there if it wasn't for another black gay man extending his hand to me and bringing me through the door and teaching me everything um, as far as running the boards, um, show prep, booking guests, all of those things that helped me to, to get to the point that I got to. I was actually a um, show producer for um, one of the longest running um, nighttime shows here in Atlanta, The Quiet Storm and Love and Relationships. And working with Joyce Littell allowed me to, to meet plenty of people like JL King. We've had him on the show. A lot of um, you know people that you've heard and you've listened to, those people come through to our show and I've had the opportunity um, to meet those people and to network. Um, is it difficult? Uh, <laughs> I think there's, there's a glass ceiling, if you will. Um, if you, you you talk to the right people, you mosey up, you cozy up to the right people, you'll be fine. There are people that are still working at that station that I know are gay, but they would never come. They would never come out. But you know, they're sitting right next to the man that sits next to the man, kind of thing up there. And you know, and, and but that happens. That's in any industry. And um, but my my experience, I had a ball up there. I had a, a great time. I learned a lot. The experience that I gained from working at V103 and WAOK was 
can't compare to, you know, anything that you can purchase out there. And it, it, it inspired me. The one thing that I took from it was that in order for you to get yourself out there, you have to create an opportunity. And that's where Better Days Radio came from. And to answer your question about um, will a, a artist, a hip hop artist, or just a mainstream artist in particular come out, I will agree with Michelle to the extent that a male artist, and hear me when I say this, a male artist is probably not going to come out because as much as we might support them in here, and well mostly we support female artists, how's everybody doing after their Beyonce day? Everybody okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, right. So what I'm saying is we're not their demographic. Females, Michelle, women of all ages, that's their demographic. They're not going to cater to us. So a woman, if she finds out, more than likely if a, a, a straight artist turns out to, to be gay, that kind of shatters the whole fantasy of, you know, well, maybe I can get with him. I'm a little bit more optimistic about the whole situation because, I mean, I remember being in New York City when, when the first gay rapper came out cautioned. Cautious, sir, or cautious. Cautious, cautious. And I remember, I remember, well, no, but my point initially is I remember that even though people were hesitant, because at that point in time everyone thought he was a natural, God given talent, he was getting accepted. He was performing at Hot 97. He was actually doing things. And I think that if that was 10, 11 years ago, I refuse to believe that, you know, in 2010 or 11, it's not possible. What I think that even when I'm doing my brand, I don't think domestic. I think that we are in an era now with the World Wide Web, with social media, with, with, with so many opportunities to where if you're only focused on selling, selling your product to your hood or to your demographic or to your region, then, then I think that you have a glass ceiling. But I think that if you're determined to be an artist, no matter what, I think that you, you think globally and think big, I think that, that, that it absolutely is possible because if you are talented and no one can deny you that, I really, really believe that there's a chance. I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, we, especially with music, we always hear that, that analogy of the person who sings and the women won't like you, blah, blah, blah. Um, and not that I'm saying it all disrespectfully because I felt the same way too, but there are a couple of things. One, everyone knew that Luther was gay. And it didn't really affect the fantasy for the women because they really got into the music. And I think that there are certain artists, I agree with you, I think there's certain R&B artists that would have a tough time. But say, for instance, if an artist like Kanye West or an artist like Will I Am or, no, I'm being quite serious, were to come out, not only do I think that they would do well, I think their numbers would increase for certain audiences. Because see, in this business, you there are multiple audiences out there, and it's one of the things that Giant is talking about. And so yes, there are R&B artists, and you know the majority of their audience is black women, 18 to 24. Okay, that's cool. If that's your artist, and that's who you want to speak to, that works for you. If you're a gospel artist, and that's where you want to say, that's fine. But for pop artists, for dance artists, for most of hip hop now, it's wide open. And so being gay doesn't necessarily have to be, again, going back to what I was saying, a negative. Which is interesting now, I think, because if you listen to each story, everyone took their responsibility in their life into their own hand and created your own opportunity, which is very powerful. But now we have so many different voices out there. How do we support one another? Why is it necessary to support one another? And how can we push open that glass ceiling that you were talking about, that we can support each other in corporate America? One of the ways we support each other is to understand that we may not agree with everybody's project, but we need to look at the veracity of that person taking a stand. You know, and my, myself, as I said before, I had no issues when people said they didn't like the project. One of the things that I wanted to put out there is that, you know, you can do your own project, and that's the story uh, for someone who may be sitting up and saying, well, I want to tell my story. You know, don't live in a time and an age where you're asking somebody for permission to tell your story. Tell your story. And I think that what we what we need to do more so as a community because people are interested in what we're doing. I mean, as we've spoken, you know, gay is like the new it thing for everybody. Uh, everybody's interested in what's urban and what's gay now, what's going on and stuff. And in our particular <clears throat> instance, we had over 10 million hits worldwide uh, with the five minute reel. You know, I call it five minutes to stop the world and it was translated to six different languages. But we had a lot of women hitting us up and was interested in 
what we were doing and what was said, and it was beyond that premise that we were down on because we were not, obviously, because we were on this and we're gay. But there was a genuine interest. And I think what happens is that the support needs to be like, I applaud the brother who does his movies and wants to tell his story. Because when he does that, there's another kid sitting somewhere that a dream is born. I applaud the brother who has his blog. I applaud the brother who does his blog when he gets up in your face. Because what that does, it gives people an opportunity to say, this could be me. And I think that's what's important for us to understand, that we're kicking over the door, and it may not benefit us as we sit in this chair, but there's a third grader who's going to come up the ranks. And he's going to be able to say, a reality show, and I've never been on TV, I've never been an executive producer, but if I put my mind to it and write my check, I can do it. And for me, that's the support that we have to do. One of the keys for, especially people that are doing this, is that we connect with one another and realize that you can't do it by yourself. You're not supposed to be doing it by yourself. There are others out there. And we have to learn to trust and to support one another. I have to be able to, if I can't be on your network, I should at least be able to talk about your network comfortably and should be able to share that and understand that lifting you up does not tear me down. So the only way that I block my blessing is by getting in my own way. I mean, I've actually been accused of not supporting my own community. Because uh, I, 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 I walk in the, in the avenue of truth, and I don't care who you are, I'm still going to be honest about what I see. Um, I think that, the thing that I, I, I'm just someone who likes to keep it real. I think that if, if we're expecting for us to be supportive of each other as gay professionals, then we should want to be supportive of each other as gay citizens. I mean, with all due respect, we ain't supportive of, of one another. We walk into a room and don't even speak to anybody because if, if they're not cute enough or we think he's looking at me. I mean, we, you walk into a room and feel so much energy and tension that that is only a reflection of, will only reflect amongst all of us. So I think it's a much bigger conversation to have about changing your thought process and realizing the fact that we are literally, truly in this together. And until we come together, then how can we come together? I agree totally with what, with what John says, and uh, another thing I actually want to um, um, uh, harp on is the um, seeing ourselves in media, but just being gay pride month, um, a lot of us are seeing the outlandish outfits from the pride parades and things of that nature um, on Facebook and Twitter, and wherever you, you know, blog posts and things like that. Um, the one thing that I do love about what we as a community do uh, with our social media is that we show that, that there is no particular one brand of gay. Um, because, huh? Oh, no, that's right. But for some odd reason, when, when, people, when people know that you're gay, it's like you have to, not only are you gay and black, so you have to represent all the black people in the whole world. <laughs> And when I go to work and switch down the aisle, I'm representing all men. And then when I go to work and, and I'm switching down the aisles, I'm representing all gay men. And then I'm representing drag queens. And then I'm representing transsexual street walkers. So it's just a lot, it's a lot that... that one of us for doing what we do and do show that there are different avenues of being gay. I just think that, you know, with with being black you have to be thick skinned and with being gay you have to be even thicker skinned. Right. And I think that if you're gonna let comments on a blog bother you, then you're in the wrong business. How do you get your films, the financing? Because people think, oh why don't you just make another film? Right. Like you did Dirty Laundry and get Rockman Dunbar and all these other famous actors. And you're like, well I need money. And like you said, Patrick is struggling trying to get financing from the community to make his next film? Um, I mean, you talked about a couple of things, so I'll try to run through the ones that I, that I feel most passionate about. I mean, I think the comparison thing, on some level, is to be expected because people need a context to have a conversation. So if there haven't been a lot of black gay filmmakers, what they're going to do, they're going to compare the first to the second, and the second to the third, and so on, and so on, and so on, until we've created sort of a, a, a critical mass where that's no longer done, and what we're simply doing is comparing filmmakers to filmmakers. So, you know, um, so I, I understand that, I get that. Um, it also doesn't particularly bother me 
Um, I always, I've always had a fairly healthy ego, um, and I don't feel like anybody else can be a better Maurice Jamal than me. So I just do my thing, and I, I write my way, I direct my way, I do my thing. Um, and I'm really, really supportive of the work of the other out filmmakers in the industry um, and love what they do. Um, I think around uh, financing and support and just sort of that whole issue, um, I mean, it is tough. But I'm also a firm believer that you don't pull someone uphill on roller skates. Meaning that if there are people around who do not support you, if there are people around who don't want to write the check, who don't want to come to the event, this or that, you need to stop beating yourself up over the head trying to figure out how you can make someone sit in the room who doesn't want to be in the room with you. What you need to do is find the individuals who are excited by your presence and invite them over and have a good time. Because we've all had one of those house parties, you know where you invite some, you invite a bunch of people over to your house and you invite all the people you think you should have or you invite the people that you think are going to have a nice conversation and it's the worst motherfucking party you've ever had in your life. And then two weeks later you'll do something like Michelle did, call somebody over to have pizza nothing's planned, and you guys end up having a great time and are hanging out all day. That's what you need to do in your personal life, and that's what you need to do in your career. You need to find the natural connections there are for what it is that you want to do. So say, for instance, if you are an artist or a writer or a filmmaker or a singer who, say, for instance, really has a social justice slant, then you may not want to break your single at the club. You might want to connect with community groups that are interested in what you're doing as a filmmaker or as an artist. And I think that kind of methodology applies all the way around. So I think for us, one of our challenges is we are so, so rarely do we get magnified, so rarely do we get heard, do we get seen, that we're so hungry that we desire to be seen by just by anybody. And you don't need just anybody to see you. And you don't need just anybody to support you. You need the individuals who truly believe in you. Not the friends who want to come to the party because they want a free ticket. It's the ones who buy a ticket to go. Right. Right. Um, with this whole 3 LWTV journey, it really began, oh, at, as I said earlier, it kind of grew up or just grew organically. But one of the things that really made me focus on making it have a purpose was that I got tired of every, t I mean, if you go on a line, which obviously I spend a lot of time on line, but you know, it's all, all the conversation was, what's up? Bored. I was like, that was like all we were. Are you top, bottom, mass, fems? You know, I mean, really? Are we that small? And that didn't reflect the world that I lived in as an out gay man. I say, like, I travel all over the world. I, I've had some wonderful experiences and I don't have like, exclusive rights to a, having a fabulous journey. Life is meant to be lived. Mm -hmm. And I choose to live it. And I thought if I do this and begin to bring people into this journey, maybe they can see that for themselves. And people say to me all the time, oh, you have such a fabulous life. I do. But again, <laughs> I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I'm very, very grateful for that. And understand that it took a lot of work. You don't see a lot of my struggle behind the scenes because I don't like to give a lot of voice and power to that because I'm focused on the solution. And if we get out of the, the habit of you know, speaking the problem and start speaking the answer, right. you start to see a lot more of that. And that's what I'm trying to do without preaching it. I'm trying to live it and show it. Wow. All right. Okay. 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 Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Big Meat from DCT with Big Meat. And uh, I have a question for all of you. We were discussing um, the whole idea of, of having a support system and making sure that you have people around you that is going to actually support the project. But for you as a visionary, how do you keep yourselves with your integrity, with the quality of the project? I think that's a great question because that's part of the journey. Um, that I went through in the beginning with the reality show, I think you have to have the integrity to one day stand back and look at yourself and ask yourself, why did I start the process of this project? And for me, my own truth was to tell my story. You know, my story was just that I was an African American man, very well educated, with raising a son, and I, I too feel like I have a fabulous life. You know, travel, you know, party, love fashion, love to entertain. And so when I started hearing certain comments about the real, I just stepped aside from myself one day and took myself out of George 
and looked at it and then kind of mulled over the different perspectives that people came from. And for me, my truth was, I wanted a show that my son could look at and be proud of and say, that's my daddy. That's the daddy that I live with every day. So at that point, I was not at a point I was so greedy to be on TV or so greedy to get a deal because I had a career before that. I backed away from the production company and the deal that was on the table because the direction they wanted to take me it was not the direction I wanted to go. And so I parted ways with cast members. You know, when you see the new show, it's going to be new cast members. I parted ways with production companies that, you know, their name alone, when you say Housewives of Atlanta, you know, people expect this stuff. And I just simply got up from the table and walked away. It was just that simple for me because I had to say to myself at the end of the day, this is my story, my truth. And then it didn't hurt that I own my own stuff. Because I wrote the check and I own the copyright, so it didn't hurt. So I was able to say, no, I'm getting ready to go. Integrity and hard work, I feel, go hand in hand. I think that, you know, I don't think you can really, really have true integrity if you're not really a hard worker. And I don't think you, you really have, you're really a hard worker if you don't have any integrity. And so I just think that, that if you keep those two in mind, I think that for me, that's what I try to do. And I try to, you know, project. And whatever your opinions are about me or vagina plug, whatever, whatever, I just think that I always am true to myself. And that's one of the reasons why I like, you know, having a company for a BET. Because there are going to be times where I will write an article for BET.com that they tell me, Giant, we can't, we can't publish that. And I love having my own space and you know what, fuck you, then I'll post myself. If you're going to, whether it's become an announcer, if you're going to be a blogger, a videographer, whatever you want to do, perfect your craft. What we live right now, what we're in, is a society where everything is instant. Um, and because every the social media makes the world a lot smaller, anybody can become an overnight celebrity. No twister. And so if you if you really want to do this, perfect your craft. You have to stay consistent, okay, as far as blogging is concerned. And you have to, but me personally, you have to know the business of blogging. Before I started blogging, I looked at everybody's site. I tried to see what ad networks they were using, what, you know, how, how did how did they do their titles or, you know, where everything was placed. And then I kind of like built my blog around, you know, looking at 15 other blogs and said, you know, this is what I want to do. And so while, you know, everybody can come along, you can start a blog tomorrow, anywhere, blog spot, whatever, but not everybody is going to make a living at it. And that's <laughs> and that's a big difference. And, you know, Giant always said, you know, if there's any way to make money, Michelle's going to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's my point. So it's like I know all the ins and outs of the networks. I know the behind the scenes. I could build my blog from scratch if I wanted to, but I hired somebody to do that. But my point is, if you're going to run it, you need to know all the intricacies and everything behind your brand and your business and, you know, from the ground up. And so... That's how I maintain my integrity, is knowing exactly everything that has to do with blogging. Quickly, I would just say, don't be desperate. And be honest with why you are doing this. Are you doing this because you have, yeah, you want to be famous and popular, you have some insecurity issues, or is it your passion? No, really, I mean, you really got to be honest about that. Because it is not fun. I mean, if you're not passionate about it, it is not fun. You watch a seven or eight minute video of mine, but you don't see that it took six, seven hours to film it, another nine hours to edit it, back and forth, the computer. You know, it's, it's lots. you got to love it to do it. So you really need to be honest with why you are pursuing it and why you choose uh, to put it forth. And do not act out of desperation. That way you do maintain your integrity. You don't make impetuous decisions and allow yourselves to be pimped. I want to thank each of these individual panelists because they adamantly and voraciously said yes when I asked them to participate. And I know they are very busy. You know, everybody's checking in for Blackberry. They know some breaking news happening in the celebrity world. What? Beyonce did what? <laughs> <laughs> she tripped down the stairs. I have to leave. But thank you all. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed a powerful, powerful evening. And just seeing a lot of my other friends who are out in the audience, like LOL Darian, more, um, JL King, who else is in the house tonight? Uh, Boy Revolution. I mean, so many wonderful, powerful, positive people in our community just uh, coming together to celebrate. Mr. Anthony Antoine, just love you all. I want to thank you for supporting 3LW TV. I'm Lonnell Williams. Always stand in your light. The people, the girls, the boys The topics, the cities, the books, the toys The models, the muscles, the health, the pride The stories, the fashion, the gays, the light Our hotness, our blackness, stand in the
TV. TV.